try that again. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right, here we are. Thank you, Ajay, for inviting us here today. Um, my name is April Wells. I'm the Public Affairs Officer at the American Consulate here in Hyderabad. And we are so happy to have the opportunity to partner again with Monthan and with all of you uh, to have a conversation about uh, a topic that we believe is of interest to all of us. Um, we are here with Dr. William Anthalis, uh, who is the Managing Director of the Brookings, Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., which is one of our most prominent think tanks in the United States. Uh, I thought it was particularly uh, useful for him to be able to come to Monthan because Monthan is an organization for people who like to think. And so we bring think tanks to thinking people, and hopefully we will have a really nice discussion. Uh, Dr. Anthalas has uh, quite a bit of expertise. Uh, I believe his bio has been shared on the month and website, but uh, of principal concern. The speaker series, I was so delighted to be asked to do it and to talk about um, this extraordinary experience that I got to share with my family two and a half years ago. It's amazing to think that it's been that long ago. I had not been back to India uh, since we left here in mid-March. We spent nine weeks here in India. Uh, a week on vacation in Thailand, and then uh, nine weeks in China. Uh, it was a great experience, at least for my wife and I. My kids, uh, they struggled at times when you ask them if they like India or China better. They say Thailand. Um, uh, for if, are you going to work the slides? So uh, one of the reasons they say Thailand is, if you click to the next slide, uh, they got to ride elephants in Thailand. We looked really hard in India, but we weren't able to find a, a place that was convenient and easy to do. Um, the talk that I'm going to give tonight is uh, an updated one of the initial talks with the book. And it's updated because the book came out in the United States a year ago. And in the year since, in the year and a half since I finished writing the book, and the year since it came out, uh, Xi Jinping has fully come to power in China and Narendra Modi has now been elected in India. And at some level, uh, these two very powerful um, powerful leaders, strong men, if you will, undercuts the, the core narrative of my book. It, it seems to fly in the face of what I'm arguing, that both of these countries' dynamism has started at the local level, and, uh, and the strong central states that once defined these countries, particularly in the aftermath of, uh, of Indian independence and of uh, the consolidation of power in the end of the Civil War in China and the consolidation of power by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, after 40 or 50 years of that central control, the liberalization that empowered the states seems to have suddenly given way back to a centralization of power. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to argue in the new opening preface of the book called The Power Par Paradox argues that precisely because of that dynamism that these men at some level have been elected to counteract, if they are going to succeed, it's going to be because they figured out a way to work with that and in some way to give power back to the localities uh, and to get right the balance between what centers should do and what states and provinces should do. And a lot less, a lot rests in the world on them getting that right. Uh, the world economy, these two, uh, these two great nations, the two largest nations on earth, were the engine behind economic growth during the financial crisis that started in the industrial world and spread uh, from the United States to Europe. And now they're starting to slow down. And one of the reasons that they have been installed and been given such great power is precisely because of that slowdown. But also, in addition to returning to economic growth, some great challenges in the world um, will only be solved if these two countries act. Um, the global effort to address poverty, more people have been lifted out of poverty because of economic growth in India and China in the last decade than anywhere else on Earth. Efforts to address climate change, with China being now the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, and India ranking third, fourth, or fifth, depending on what you count uh, and, uh, and when you count it. Um, and also efforts to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons and to address regional and security challenges. India and China are critical to that. But it's no longer Beijing and New Delhi that are solely critical. 
to that. Places like Hyderabad and Shanghai, Chennai, and Chengdu uh, are just as important to what happens in the world as Beijing and New Delhi. So as we traveled, Kristen and my wife and I and our daughters, Annika and Kiri, traveled, all of us got into the act of asking questions where we were. How does this state or province work? What do people do here? How do they blend local and national economics, local and national politics here, and local and national values? And also, how do they view the wider world? The book is called Inside Out, Local Politics Go Global. How do these cities and states view themselves in the world economy? Do they see a role for themselves? How do they pitch themselves to attract foreign investment? What are they trying to sell to the rest of the world? And the question kept coming back to me, why do I care? Um, well, in addition to all those big global forces and challenges that I listed before, I also said that I come from a political system that though it's one third the size, faces the same challenges. And when uh, I shared the same uh, email ending as uh, April, when I worked at the State Department and then moved from there and worked at the White House, I spent as much of my time explaining US domestic politics to diplomats from other countries, why on a trade agreement, um, Iowa corn farmers uh, needed to have their issues addressed. And I would hear from Europeans why uh, French uh, cheese farmers or, or you know, cattle farmers in France who made cheese, why their issues needed to be addressed. In a climate change negotiation, why coal miners from West Virginia um, or uh, solar panel installers from Germany had issues that were important in the negotiation. Oil and gas in Louisiana, oil and gas in Ukraine. Uh, intellectual property rights in California, in London, or in France all played out differently. And as we look to India and China, which are four times the size of the United States or Europe, very few of us really knew and understood a decade ago when I was in the government uh, or 15 years ago when I was in the government, what the different parts of these countries cared about in the world. And so I wanted to know and be able to explain and understand how those forces played internally. And one of the reasons for that is that I worked for a president who came from a small landlocked state that ranked low on all the rankings you want to rank high on and high on all the rankings you want to rank low on, uh, Bill Clinton. The state was ranked high in corruption and low in uh, economic activity, low in literacy, um, high in drug use. Yet Bill Clinton saw a global, though he grew up in a small town um, with a single mother, he also saw out there a global future, got a global education, and was the president that brought America into the age of globalization. But he started doing that while he was the governor of this small landlocked state. Uh, and now one of America's largest global corporations, Walmart, was based in his state. And he, as governor, took it on trade missions around the world. So I had a local experience that was very critical, not just to, to my country, but to my life personally. And I wanted to understand where the next leaders from India and China were going to come from. And what were the experiences that shaped them either to embrace the global world order or to pull back from it and be fearful of it. So we started in China. Um, China, can we go to the next slide, please? China is um, a very unified nation. It is not a federal system. And the fact that this map is so white uh, it is maybe a good way to start thinking about China, which is it saw itself for years, and it projects itself both internally and to the rest of the world as a unified nation. When I would say that I was studying federalism, they would say there is no federalism in China. The states are not sovereign at all. Um, and liberalization only came to China in 1980. And 10 years later, you only began to see economic growth in two provinces, uh, really. Um, Shanghai and Guangdong, with a little bit of growth in Liaoning, and some growth in Beijing, but most of the Beijing growth was because it was the nation's capital and it was collecting tax revenues from those places that were starting to grow. Um, 
Mao inherited uh, this country of 30 provinces. He forcefully unified them, and he kept them unified. And after initially debating whether or not to have a federal system where each of the states governed themselves, he chose to govern it in a way that the US would say govern, govern its military bases or its embassy. Every five years, the head of each of these provinces is rotated from one province to the next. These are people that report to Beijing and ultimately return to Beijing after five years of service uh, managing uh, essentially what are the states of China or their provinces. They're rotated like military base commands. But they were given in 1980 a single order after um, the Cultural Revolution and the economic devastation of, of Chairman Mao's uh, Great Famine. Deng Xiaoping changed the rules. He said, look, there's going to be one set of rules. But what I really want you to do is interpret the rules in your own special way. And you're going to be graded on, on two things. The most important thing is how fast you grow your economy, what I call GDP monotheism. And that was the, um, that was the good God. And the bad God was uh, whether or not there was political disturbance uh, or uprising in your state. So you got good credits if you grew your economy, and bad credits if you had uprising. And for ten, the first 10 years, this work, uh, it started to work. And if you go to the next slide, he inherited this China, which is still about half of the country. China is still only 50% urban and 50% rural. But after 10 years of economic growth, go to the next slide, after 20 years of economic liberalization, you saw this begin to emerge. The coastal provinces in China, GDP started appearing between about $1,000 and $2,500 a person per capita. That's nominal GDP. And the center part of the country also started rising. Now, a number of things are happening here 20 years after economic liberalization. Along the coast, they first started selling goods and services right across the straits to Hong Kong, to Taiwan, and in the North China, uh, in the North China Sea, across the straits to Japan and Korea. So goods and services were flowing out, mostly goods, and investment was starting to come in. In inland China, the economy was starting to grow as well, mostly because agriculture was liberalized. So farmers were allowed to own what they produced and were allowed to sell it into markets. And there was also the beginning of a great fiscal transfer, or what some people call Robin Hood economics, which is you tax the rich and you give it to the poor. So the money is being taken from the coastal provinces, routed through Beijing, which you can see is a very dark spot. Um, and it's a very dark spot because the taxes are collected there, and some of them are spent there. And then they're sent into the central province. So by 2000, go to the next slide, please. By 2010, it has developed to this point. Now you can see that, that economic growth on the coast um, just four years ago was about uh, between $5,000 and $12,000 per capita, approaching and surpassing uh, Central and Eastern European levels. And in some places like Shanghai and in Beijing, higher than that even still in the $20,000. Just to break this down a little bit, Guangdong province, which you'll see to the south, which is right across the straits from Hong Kong, Zhejiang province, which is two provinces north, Shanghai, which is a, a municipal province, it's a municipality of 22 million people that has the standing of a province, and Jiangsu, uh, just to the north of that. Those four provinces have a total of about 240 million people, so less than a quarter of China's total population. Yet they are responsible. Those four provinces alone are responsible for 80% of China's exports. So when you are buying something that says made in China, it is almost certainly from one of those four provinces. And it's most likely of those four provinces from Guangdong, which by itself is responsible for half of those 80%. 40% of all Chinese exports come out of Guangdong. Um, but two things started happening in the coast. One was this export-oriented manufacturing. Some of it was private sector, truly privately owned companies, particularly in Guangdong and Zhejiang, 
Some of it was state-owned companies that still were exporting things, but uh, were, had certain economic benefits given to them by the central and the provincial governments. So you had this economic growth, um, but you also had uh, political liberalization happening, particularly in Guangdong, Zhejiang, and to some degree in Shanghai. We'll talk about that in a second. You had higher wages. Um, many people would move in from central China to the coast. Hundreds of millions of people, actually, workers, would come in. They wouldn't get full worker rights. And so they started organizing as, uh, and forming labor unions to argue for better worker rights. So for instance, they couldn't get what's called a huko. It's a, a residency permit that also exists in many Indian cities um, that, oh, that give them benefits to things like better housing, um, education for their children, health care. Most workers don't get the full huko when they travel to the coast. So they leave their families behind and work for six months or a year and then go back and live for a year and then come back one year later. They were having freer speech. With those higher living standards, they would have access to this. And if any of you are on Twitter, you know you get 140 characters in a tweet, which you can send out to however many people follow you. In English, 140 characters is a sentence or two. It's a headline. It's a text message. In China, 140 characters in Mandarin is a paragraph. So if you fire off four of those, you have an essay. And if you have 100 followers, you have a town hall meeting. If you have 1,000 followers, you have a radio station. And if you have 10,000 followers, you have a mass movement. And suddenly, you have free speech, mostly in coastal China. Because if you move inland in China, you can't afford one of these. You can afford a regular cell phone. A regular cell phone may or may not have text messages. So the internet phenomena that's happening in China is largely a coastal phenomena and an urban phenomena, and largely a coastal urban phenomena. In addition to free speech and social media, you also had peasant uprisings, particularly in the coast. And the reason that the peasant uprisings were happening in the coast was because land prices had become so expensive that the way they were developed, I don't need to explain land acquisition here, uh, but, but the the basics here were that the communist government didn't really care what the locals said. They would move them off the land. They would claim eminent domain, seize the land. And because of these deals were, because these deals were often done with the non-elected mayors of these localities, the villagers would often rise up against that. Or if it wasn't actually moving people off the land, it was building a highway through the middle of someone's farm or dropping power lines through the middle of someone's farm, or polluting the water or river near someone's farm. In one uprising in particular in uh, the village of Wukan, which is down in Guangdong province. Um, actually, go to the next slide, please. This gentleman, Wang Yang, who was the party secretary of Guangdong province, who experimented with NGO rights, experimented with free speech, let the local newspapers print and publish what they wanted, um, didn't crack down on the use of Weibo for political speech. When there was a village uprising in Wukan, he um, sided with the villagers and got rid of the party, the local party officials, which at that point was unheard of. And suddenly there was a talk of village-level democracy in China. And this gentleman actually got promoted for it. Uh, in the last party shuffle, he moved to Beijing, and he is now a vice premier working for the premier, not the president, Xi Jinping, for the premier, Li Kaisheng. And he's even been quoted in Jeffersonian sounding language, or at least to an American who happens to live in the town that Thomas Jefferson is from. He would say, unless you embrace the rights of the people, the people will not work with you on the things you want them to. And that's a very uncharacteristic, to, to say the rights of the people is quite uncharacteristic in China. But that, that's not the only model in China. There is a different model, which is the Chongqing model. Next slide, please. Chongqing is in central China. And until, uh, until exactly the week that I arrived in China, it was governed by this gentleman, Mr. Bo Xilai, who was the party secretary in Chongqing. He had served in a number of different positions before. He had been a mayor. He had been the provincial party secretary in a coastal province called Liaoning. 
and he had served as the commerce minister in Beijing. And he was appointed to run Chongqing. Now, Chongqing is in the Western Triangle. There are three provinces. Chongqing, which you can see highlighted, just west of it, Sichuan province, where all the spicy food comes from, and the city of Chengdu is. And just to the north of that, Shanxi province, uh, which is where the terracotta warriors are buried in the city of Xi'an. Chinese civilization was essentially started there 5,000 years ago. And modern, what we think of as the modern contours of China were centralized and built as one country, unified there by the Emperor Qin in 221 uh, BC, uh, about 2,500, almost 2,500 years ago now. That is, in a sense, the cradle of Chinese uh, political civilization. At a moment when Athens and Rome, that happened in 221 BC, about 200 years after the peak of uh, Periclean Athens and Athenian democracy, and 200 years before the peak of the Roman Empire. So right in the middle of those two things, China was formed. Yet at a time today when Europe and the European Union is debating whether to keep Rome and Athens in the Union, there's no debate in China. The Chinese political model is to tax Guangdong and send the proceeds to Chongqing, because economic development there is still far behind. And a man like Bo Xilai, therefore, has a very different governance model. On the one hand, he created 16.4% economic growth. So the Chinese system rewarded him for a terrific performance. But he did it by spending almost $16 billion to build 800,000 public housing units. He also used state-owned enterprises and state-backed loans, that is central government and local government-backed loans, um, to develop real estate, both commercial and residential real estate, that has fueled one of the great real estate um, booms in, in all of the world, in central China there. He also fought a, a crime on corruption, uh, a war on crime and corruption. And uh, he did things like planting trees to offset uh, the local air pollution. He had people singing Mao-era songs. Uh, essentially, this was a top-down model, not only of economic growth, but of governance. It was a strong hand and a strong state. Next slide, please. So as I said, he was out there saving Xi'an. There are the terracotta warriors, Chengdu and Chongqing. Uh, next slide, please. Just to give you a sense of how the Robin Hood economy works, this is the internal imbalance of trade. So you'll see Guangdong, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, Shanghai, those coastal provinces are net um, in a trade exporters. They're essentially not just sending goods and services to the rest of the world. They're also making things and pumping them into inland China. And so the rest of inland China, both in terms of uh, trade flows and also uh, monetary flows, are sending finances, though, though cash is being pumped in by the state government, expenditures from the local provinces are going back out to the coast. Next slide. What that has meant is the following problems in inland China. First, click. You have this GDP monotheism of grading provincial leaders. And that's still the case across China. Next click, please. The coastal provinces are starting to pursue these broader goals of NGOs and environmental protection. But there's no real, real way to grade those local leaders to incorporate those things. Next slide, please. The inland and provinces are still sacrificing everything for growth. They're trying very hard to catch up, even if that means creating crime and corruption. Next slide. The growth model in inland China means urbanization is a magnet. Next slide. They're trying to move 1.25 million people each month from the countryside into the cities. But rather than moving them to the coast, they're moving them to Boshilai's Chongqing, to Xi'an, and Chengdu. Next slide. Heavy construction is the fuel of economic growth, and it's very energy intensive. Next click. 70% of all of that power comes from coal, and that includes transport uh, fuels. So trains are often run by coal. Um, 
And it means that in all of China, 90% of electricity comes from coal, which is a huge amount. Next click. It's causing huge air pollution problems. And every other attempt to get off of that is problematic in China. Next click, please. There's uh, a Chinese goal to build 1,000 nuclear reactors. Uh, but they face a challenge in that they don't have enough um, nuclear power expertise in the country to manage that. They've built huge capacity in solar and wind panel, uh, solar panel, panels and wind turbines, but they can't get them to where they need them. Uh, if you think about a map of China and you draw a diagonal line from the southwest to the northeast, 90% of people live to the south and east of that diagonal. That is, 1.1 1 .1 and a half billion people live to the south and east, and it's mostly cloudy and rainy there. Um, in the north and west, where no one lives, it's windy and sunny. But the problem, so the problem is that you can't site the power near where the people are, and power loses its energy as it travels over transmission lines. So there's a real challenge in using all this renewable energy in China and getting it to where it's needed for use. Next question. Natural gas is really hard to get in China. It's actually abundant in two places, in that dry northwest and in the wet, wet southeast. In the dry northwest, you need water to get to natural gas, and there's no water to be had. In the southeast, the natural gas is way below the Earth's surface, and the water is already somewhat polluted. And since that's the rice basket of China, or the rice bowl of China, there's a real fear about polluting that water even more. So it's impossible to get to that natural gas. Next, please. And the effort to get oil to China requires a US security guarantee. They essentially get oil from the Gulf. They bring it around uh, the uh, Indian Ocean, through the Straits of Malacca, through the South and East China Seas. And in order to get it there, um, the only thing that's really providing security is the alliance between the United States, Japan, India, and other maritime powers to make sure that the sea lanes are kept open. Next slide. And then there are these challenges, particularly in inland China. Next slide. Building up these cities has been a highly debt, uh, a, a high, an exercise in high debt. There's about three trillion U.S. dollars um, of debt, probably unrecoverable, in this real estate bonanza that's happened in inland China. Essentially, they've built cities that are more expensive than what most Chinese workers can afford, and it's unclear whether and how they're going to recover the revenues for that debt. Just to give you a sense of that debt, we often hear about the fact that China owns U.S. debt, U.S. Uh, Treasury bonds. China owns $1.25 trillion of U.S. Treasury bonds. Yet it's, es yet it's estimated that there's about $3 trillion of debt in inland China. Next question. And that inland growth, as we talked about before, is very energy intensive. So all across China, that's in Beijing, but in every Chinese city, you have unbelievably polluted air. This quote, India is dirty, and China, but China is polluted, comes from one of my kids as we traveled. We had taken our kids to the best parts of India, but we also took them to slum villages in Mumbai and, and other places. And when we got to China, at first they thought, oh, China is so modern and the cities are gleaming. But we spent just a few weeks there, and they started commenting on the air. We would judge a clear day on whether we could see more than four blocks from our apartment window in the in Beijing skyline. Less than four blocks was a bad day. Four to eight blocks was a good day. In our one month in Beijing, we had five days where we could see more than eight blocks. And Beijing was a relatively clean air city compared to Chengdu or Xi'an or Chongqing. I'm a runner. I like to run outside. I run outside in every city we lived in in India. Shanghai was the only city in China where I could run outside. Next slide. And then there are the crime and corruption issues, particularly in inland China, um, where you have this top-down growth fueled by, uh, top-down both growth and political order fueled by money coming first from Beijing through the government leaders. There are great opportunities for the leaders to skim the money off the top. And essentially, Though Bo Xi Lai went to prison because his wife killed a British businessman and he covered it up, essentially he ran a corruption scheme locally. And that was what ultimately brought him down 
among the other Chinese government leaders. Next, please. So generally speaking, the story for China is uh, the slope is steep, but the road is slippery. The slope has been very steep going up. This has been a very fast rising economy. But it's one that's based on both real economic growth in a few key places and laggard economic growth in the place where most Chinese live. And the big challenge in China is how to reform that economy. And much of that reform happens in a couple post coastal provinces that still have state-owned enterprises. But the biggest part of the reform is in the less productive part of the economy. And that's the challenge that Xi Jinping uh, faces. How to keep all of this together and how to promote growth in inland China. Next, please. So how does India stack up against this? This is India 10 years after liberalization. Much like China, there are a couple places that have begun to grow. But it's not that uh, the growth is not that great. Next, please. Most of India in 2000 was this India. But then another 10 years after that, 20 years after liberalization, next please, this is India. Again, you can track these GDP numbers with the same GDP growth of China for the same number of years after liberalization. So this is what China looked like in 2000. China started roughly in late 1970s, early 1980. Indian liberalization started um, when Manmohan Singh was finance minister. Uh, in, uh, in 1990 or so, 20 years later, you're starting to see a number of states, mostly coastal states, uh, taking advantage of economic growth, marketing themselves to the rest of the world. But here, local political leaders uh, were seizing power. I mean, liberalization happened. But the local leaders were working with the Indian Administrative Service to work on state-oriented economic goals as opposed to centrally planned economic goals. Next, please. And so by 2010, this had become the model of middle class Indian success. Now, in, uh, in full disclosure, um, I, am, I am a total shill for two companies in the world, Bajaj Motor, Scooter, Motor Scooters and Nike uh, Sportswear. Uh, Raul Bajaj is on my board of trustees, or my international advisory board, and uh, Phil Knight from Nike is. So I, I will just openly say that I work for these two men. Uh, I, I say that jokingly, but I, I, what I really believe is the Bajaj scooter has been the biggest part of India's success story. It started back in the days of the closed state and early regulation, and he, he benefited from a monopoly. But I think Raul Bajaj came to realize, like a lot of other Indian leaders, business leaders, that he couldn't be a protectionist anymore, that he had to compete in the global economy, and he had to take advantage of global technology. So now he stake, makes motor scooters in India that he sells all over the world. He sells them in Africa. He sells them in Latin America. He sells them in Southeast Asia. And, um, and within India, having access to private transportation is a true sign of ur moving into the urban middle class. Our kids love to see um, the auto rickshaws filled with other school-age children going to school in the morning with their um, lunch boxes all hanging from the back of the, uh, the scooter. For them, that was a sign of a vibrant, young economy. And I think all of us should think of it that way. Next slide, please. The great model, of course, for Indian economic growth at the state level was Narendra Modi. Uh, he took Gujarat, um, uh, and he leaned forward in Gujarat. It was, as you know, I don't need to tell you this story. You know this story really well. But this is the story that I tell Americans in the book. He was the top-ranking state for economic growth for a decade. Um, he became prime minister in a landslide. Um, but two years ago when I was here and when I met with Narendra Modi, that was far from a secured outcome. It was uncertain because of the past communal violence in Gujarat whether he could build a national coalition. Um, he was rising, and his star was rising because of his economic successes. But he seemed to still not have worked out uh, how to pull this together in a theme that could unify India. And there was another model for state-level growth that was very different, which is the one in Bihar for Nitish Kumar, who was often talked about two years ago as potentially another man that could bring together India. Um, now, this was a very different model of economic growth. Uh, it was more state-led, but different than what Bo Xilai was doing in Chongqing. Yes, he also had a crackdown on crime and corruption. 
Yes, he was also using revenues that had come to him from Beijing to build roads, but he was focusing his efforts on an economy much lower on the economic chain. When he, inherit, when he first came to power in Bihar, I think GDP per capita was about $300 a year. And in his seven or eight years at the helm in Bihar, he doubled it, taking it to nearly $600 a year. Um, he focused on girls' education, and he focused on um, uh, fighting crime and corruption. And he was building a cross-caste coalition, which was really, uh, at the time, quite unique, particularly in nearby Uttar Pradesh, where Mayawati had governed in a much more caste-driven kind of politics. So Nitish Kumar was getting beyond identity politics and going into development politics. As we all know, um, the outcome of who between these two men might pull together the NDA coalition was quite clear. Um, it was Narendra Modi. It was a landslide of historic proportions. Um, again, you all know this better than an American audience was. But the thing that's quite striking to me, particularly here in, um, in Hyderabad, in Telangana, with Andhra Pradesh, is that this is the beginning of the end of where his dominance reigns. As you move farther to the east and to the south, the BJP dominance begins to fade. And this speaks to what I talked about in the beginning, that even in a country like India, where now you have a strong man as a leader, he still is going to have to reckon with, uh, with the states. How do states get their way in India? They do it in two ways. One is through the national parliament. Of course, the narrative had been that um, uh, next click. The narrative had been that with the rise of regional parties, um, that the Congress Party couldn't pull together the Congress Party, which was really the only national party of India. That's what people said for years couldn't pull together a dominant co governing coalition. Uh, next click. And coalition politics, therefore, emp empowers the local party chiefs who could pull their, con their, um, their state's representatives out of that governing coalition. And to pass some of the major national level reforms that Mr. Modi will want to pass, he still needs to go through the upper house, through the Raj Sabha. And that still represents the states, and he still does not have a majority there. Then again, he has to still work with state-level government. So next click. Um, the states still control some fiscal affairs. They can, because of particularly the kind of leadership Mr. Modi exercised, wrestle that control away from the Indian Administrative Service or have the service work with them to implement investments in the state. Next. They'll focus those resources on competitiveness policy. Today, um, we had a meeting with some of the industrial officials uh, for Telangana, and they are working on a plan that focuses on the core elements of competitiveness policy, getting access to land, next clip, in, investing in infrastructure, investing in energy, um, uh, roads, and, uh, roads and sewers and power. These are the critical things where a state can be competitive. They also will be important in the inter-border taxes as part of the reform of the GST. Next slide. The challenge of the dysfunctions of the state that these men and that Mr. Modi is now trying to address is economic uh, stagnation. Uh, economic performance in the states ranges from 10% growth to 4% growth. And there's persistent poverty. And then there are the minority rights and wrongs that happen across India which are left to state level, but also create national tension. And then each of the states often can act in a provocative, particularly the bordering states, can act in a provocative way towards its neighbors. So you get Gujarat and uh, JMK uh, and the Punjab against Pakistan, West Bengal in issues with uh, Bangladesh, and Tamil Nadu in issues with Sri Lanka. So the bordering states start to run their own foreign policies, and that's a challenge that Mr. Modi had posed to the central government when he was running uh, Gujarat. And it's now a challenge that the other state governments will pose to him now that he's the national leader. So he's still going to have to work with these states if he's going to be successful. A top-down approach may not work so well. Next slide. 
So why should the U.S. care? The U.S. cares because these are massive economies, the two uh, uh, largest developing countries in the world. And economic stagnation in these places could affect, could affect world growth, U.S. trade, and the like. Political authority in these two places is different from one another. I say it's upside down. In China, the challenge is the central government's rulemaking can't keep up with the local spending and impl implementation that it needs to track with and that it's been needing to delegate. And it's going to have to rein some of that in without limiting the economic dynamism that has been the engine of economic growth in China. In India, it's the exact opposite. India has elected officials from the local village level all the way up to the state, all the way up to the national government. But those local officials had not been invested with authority before because the Indian Administrative Service seemed to be in command. And now what you get in Gujarat, what Chandrababu Naidu had done here so successfully, is state level leaders seizing that bureaucracy and working with that bureaucracy to attract trade and investment. That effort's going to have to continue. It's going to have to expand to a number of other states. And it's also going to have to push down further to other cities and localities that are going to see themselves as the engines of economic growth. This, of course, has global implications. These two countries are major trading partners in an integrated global economy. And they're potential partners in global peace and security. If you could just go back so I can just finish the last bit of that one. Yeah, go back one more. Uh, and, of course, these two countries are the largest emitters in the world, as I mentioned. And they also have large nuclear stockpiles. Last slide. <coughs> one thing that I've been describing in describing this to Americans is how little Americans know about these two great countries. To give you a sense of the size of your own country, um, if you've not thought about it this way before, 1.2 billion people is roughly the population of the United States plus Mexico, plus Brazil, plus everything else in North and South America. And you have to also add the 500 million people living in 27 countries in Europe. Okay, That's about 1.3 billion people. You're a little bit shy of that. So you have to just pull one 100 million person country out of that mix and you get to 1.2. So that's the size of China. In that geographic landscape of North and South America and the European Union, there are 100 U.S. embassies and consulates combined in North and South America and Europe. Yet in India, we have one embassy and four consulates. In China, we have one embassy and five consulates, which means that um, April and Salil have to work five times as hard or ten times as hard as their counterparts in Europe and the United States to reach all the places that either already matter or could matter for a stronger relationship. If students from here want to get visas to go to the United States, if um, H-1V workers want to get, you know, tech workers want to get the H-1B visa, or if American companies want to invest here, or Indian companies from here want to invest in the United States and learn how to do that, they need access to that nodal point. And if you drew this same map for corporate sub-headquarters for most American companies, it probably looks pretty similar to this. So there may be, we were talking before about McDonald's, there may be McDonald's in sub-cities throughout um, uh, Telangana or Andhra Pradesh, but there's probably a McDonald's headquarters here in Hyderabad. In Europe, you would have dozens of sub-headquarters of equal prominence. So, one of the messages that I give to American investors who ask me about this is to have an India strategy or a China strategy is like having a Europe strategy. You can't have a single strategy for a country as, as large as this one. You need to break it down and think about the three or four places that are forward states, the more advanced, more globally oriented states. But maybe there's also a strategy that goes for the Bihars and the Uttar Pradeshs that are at a different level of economic development. So you have to be nuanced. But then from a political and strategic standpoint, we also have to get to know these countries better. And I say this with respect to China more than with respect to India. And just, I'll just close on this story about Bo Xilai, and then we can have a conversation. When Bo Xilai was brought down, he was brought down because his police chief, a guy named Wang Lijun, found out that Bo's wife had killed this British businessman. 
Because he and Boshi Lai had been so successful in cracking down on crime and corruption, he assumed that Boshi Lai would crack down on his wife. And they were estranged, and Boshi Lai had many mistresses, and he just figured that she was done and that he and Bo were going to arrest her. And of course, Boshi Lai turned on him, had him arrested, put under house arrest, fired from his job. Boshi Lai's mistake was only putting him under house arrest because Wang Lejun then dressed himself as a woman, um, got into uh, uh, a car in his house, and drove off and evaded his security detail. They, first of all, a Chinese official would never drive his own car. And secondly, he was disguised as a woman. So he went off by himself. And 200, he drove 200 miles in the middle of the night and went to the US consulate in Chengdu, in neighboring Sichuan province. When Bo Xiaoyi figured this out, he sent 70 police cars chasing after him in the middle of the night. And they surrounded the US consulate. The US consular officers, woken in the middle of the night by this guy named Wang Lejun, who was a national hero for cracking down on crime and corruption, Wang Lejun was asking for asylum. So he comes into the consulate. Um, they have a conversation. And then the consul general looks outside and sees the uh, Chongqing police cars surrounding the consulate. And he calls in for support. Uh, and essentially, they call up to Beijing. And the interior, uh, the, the minister for the interior, that is for interior security, has to fly down to Chengdu the next day and resolve the crisis. Why do I tell you this story? Wang Lijun had to drive from China's largest city 200 miles in the middle of the night and cross provincial borders to find a US consulate, because there's not a US consulate in, Chung, in Chongqing. Now, I'm not blaming the United States for this as a general matter. We have budget cuts. We haven't really gotten to know China before. And it's certainly not the State Department's fault, because I think the State Department would love to have wider representation and has begun to move things in that direction. We have our own congressional budget limits for these kinds of things. But it's more of a mindset in the West that we have not started to think about these two countries and have a presence to understand what's happening. And particularly in China, where central China is likely to be a place where the, the, slope, the, um, the, steep is, uh, the slope is steep and the road is slippery, we're going to have to be watching a lot more carefully to see what runs up and what slides down. Uh, so with that, I'm, I'm open to your questions and answers, and I look forward to having a conversation. Mm -hmm.